1991, the alternative took over the mainstream. And for a 13-year-old kid like myself, it was a life-changing moment. It came out of nowhere, or at least so it seemed. I'm going to talk to you about the birth and the evolution of grunge by going through my vinyl collection on this episode, Talking About Records. My name is G.I. Sanders from NTX Vinyl, a small chain of independent record shops in the Dallas Fort Worth area. If you're not local, but you're in the U.S., you can shop with us online anytime at ntxvinyl.com. And of course, would love it if you'd subscribe here to our YouTube channel. Follow us across social media at NTX Vinyl is the handle on Facebook and Instagram. Let's talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, and that is the birth and evolution of grunge on vinyl. So I'm going to go through um, a piece of my collection, which, man, when I when I pulled this crate out, started going through these albums, putting them in timeline order, it was so much fun. I ended up listening to a lot of them, which I haven't heard in a long time. Um, it is a time and a place that if you were there and if you were of the right age, um, I don't think it is uh, overstated to say that it was life-changing. I know it was for me. And I know it was for a lot of other people. If um, I mentioned at the top, I was 13 years old in 1991 when Nevermind came out, and that's really what broke the mold. That's what um, that's what got kids in the suburbs, in cities all over the U.S. and the world to take notice of what had been going on for a long time. Um, Nirvana is what broke through into the mainstream, of course, but there are years and years of, uh, there's years and years of history and of artists and of albums that predated that. And that's kind of what we're going to go through. Um, for me, it's, uh, it is a moment in time and it's a, an era of music that I'm just completely fascinated with because again, it was at a time in my life when I was young and impressionable and musically pretty lost. I can tell you, uh, prior to Never mind. So let's say around 1990, again, I'm 12 years old. I'm listening to, you know, obviously pop radio. That's what every, you know, kind of 12 year old kids are listening to, whatever their parents have on. So, you know, at the time, this is, this is Michael Jackson. This is Madonna. This is, um, you know, Bruce Springsteen. So there was some good stuff. And of course I knew of Guns N' Roses. There were some rock bands that I was into, certainly classic rock and some Zeppelin, but I was also into like hip hop. I was also into country. I was all over the place. Pretty much anything um, that other people around me were consuming, um, that's what I kind of gravitated towards. I didn't have anything that was my own thing. And that's what this did. This gave me something that I felt I could take ownership in because it was happening in real time while I was young and kind of watching it happen, which was just fascinating to see. And for me, and I think a lot of people, it came out of nowhere. Again, it felt like it was a true explosion, an overnight thing. But of course, you go back and you learn and this had been brewing for years. So when you talk about grunge as kind of a, a genre or an era of music, of course, most of it um, that people think of came out of out of Seattle, right? Out of the Pacific Northwest. So uh, there's a lot of that, but there are some albums too that came out of other scenes that I've, I've sprinkled in here because I think they are important to the story. Um, the other thing to talk about before we even get to this is where it all came from. So um, all of these bands and these albums were obviously heavily influenced by um, artists that came before them. So artists like Black Flag and Fugazi and the Minutemen and Sonic Youth and Dinosaur Jr. and Butthole Surfers, uh, the Meat Puppets, uh, certainly R.E.M., Husker Du, and then you have bands like Pixies and Primus and Jane's Addiction, Red Hot Chili Peppers. All these bands were already working and, uh, you know, very underground in the mid to late 80s before the grunge explosion happened, right? And then you had 
a whole list of bands that are mostly completely unheard of, like the Human and Malfunction and Drange Addiction and 10 Minute Warning and the Fastbacks and Skin Yard. You had those big influences, and then you had the initial seeds, and that's what those bands were. So a lot of the people who went on to found these bands that we've all heard of and we know we love now were in bands for many, many years before they had any amount of success, even locally or regionally, much less nationally, right? So um, as I've gone back and researched this era for you know my entire life, essentially been fascinated with going back and learning about it, uh, the family tree and the connection between all these artists is just fascinating. And as you go through these, you start to see it time and time again. So um, let's kick off by uh, starting with an album, but I think that I think is pretty much well regarded as the start of the grunge scene. If you're going to talk about a singular release and a singular artist, most everyone, the people that were in the scene and the people who have covered the scene and onlookers like myself who are just fans of the scene will point to Green River. This is their uh, debut EP called Come On Down. Um, it says it right here. One of the first grunge record ever released, right? Um, this is uh, this is the starting point. This is really when uh, this came out. First of all, you got to keep in mind, this came out in September of 85. So I was seven years old. So obviously way too young to be uh, experiencing anything like this. But as I've gone back and as again, I've, I've learned, uh, this is where it all started. This is uh, the culmination of uh, Jeff Amitz and Stone Gossard from Pearl Jam and Mark Arm and Steve Turner, who went on to form Mudhoney. This is where they started. This is one of the, um, the first examples of kind of garage rock and a little bit of metal and certainly punk all coming together and fusing into something unique. So Green River was the start. It was the spawn of so much to come after it. Um, the other thing that happened not long after this, which is in March of 86, and I don't have it unfortunately, is a compilation called Deep Six. So Deep Six came out on, not Sub Pop, it came out on CZ Records, which was a, a pretty short-lived um, regional label in the Pacific Northwest. And it featured Green River, it featured the Melvins, it featured Skin Yard, U-Men, Soundgarden. Um, it's a very valuable compilation if you can find it. Um, Come On Down and the Deep Six Comp, those are the first two, I think, kind of tent pole releases in 85, 86 that kind of set the stage for what was to come. So what was to come? One of the bands that I think is overlooked a ton is the Screaming Trees. This is not their debut. This is even if and especially when. This is their second album. And the reason why I pulled this one out is A, because I don't have the debut, but more so because this came out on SST Records. So Screaming Trees weren't actually based in Seattle proper. They were outside the area, but they're very much known in the scene. And this, uh, you know, this is released in March of 87 on SST and SST was founded by uh, Greg Ginn from Black Flag. So you had very much an underground connection and SST would be a thread through um, several other artists and releases throughout uh, throughout this crate. But um, a, again, a, a band that was way ahead of its time and that didn't catch on until years later and honestly never got the kind of attention they deserved, even though they did go on to sign major label deals and, and record and stuff like that. But Screaming Trees were very early. Another one that I just like Deep Six that I don't have in my collection that came out around the same time is the the debut full length from the Melvins. That is Gluey Porch Treatments. I don't have that record, but the Melvins and Screaming Trees along with Soundgarden and Green River, that's where it all started. Like if you go talk uh, you go read read about or you go talk to people who were in this scene, they will point back to those as kind of the pinnacle releases. Again, you can go back further with, again, You Men and 10 Minute Warning and Fastbacks and some of the other bands, but I think all of that was more considered like uh, post-punk or garage or the, you know all these other type of genres. If you want to zero in on what is commonly referred to and defined as grunge, those are the artists that really, um, that really established it. So Green River goes on and puts out um, Dry as a Bone. This is June 5th of 87. This is the follow-up to Come On Down, another EP uh, on Sub Pop. So Sub Pop 
if you don't know, is a very uh, a huge part of this story as well, and uh, is a, a, a line that runs through a lot of these as well. So you've got Green Rivers, Dry the Bone EP coming out in 87, and Soundgarden's debut EP, Streaming Life, coming out in late 87, October 1st. So the combination of these um, happening in 87 are continuing to create that groundswell. A lot of people don't know Chris Cornell was on drums originally, so there was a bunch of earlier Soundgarden stuff in this, but Chris was on drums, pulling double duty, trying to sing as well. Not until Matt Cameron left Skin Yard and came to join Soundgarden did they really uh, form and then go on to record this initial EP, which also came out uh, came out on Sub Pop, I believe. Yeah, so um, that was really important. Also important in October of 87 was when Green River decides to split. That's a very important part of this story in the early stages. Green River splits. Sub Pop sees it through. They had recorded their first full length, the first two were EPs. Uh, Steve Turner decides to leave the band. He's not into it anymore. He's not getting along with Jeff and Stone as far as the direction that they wanted to take the band. So Steve Turner exits. They record Rehab Doll. They break up and then Sub Pop puts Rehab Doll out in May of 88. Right, May of '88, the final release from Green River comes out, and then what happens? Right, the band's broken up. Well, you know what happens. Uh, Mud Honey is formed. You got Mark Arm and Steve Turner come back together, and they release Super Fuzz Big Muff in October of '88. So October of '88 is the birth of Mud Honey, and if you uh, go back and research the scene, Mud Honey was by and large the first band to break. Um, they went over to Europe. They were the first band to play in Europe. They were the first band to do like TV and radio over in Europe. Didn't have a lot going on um, in the States. They'd come back to the States and they were touring with Sonic Youth, which was a big part. Bands like Sonic Youth really being supportive of a lot of these bands was uh, huge. But this comes out and breaks Mud Honey, and they got um, a ton of attention in the early, early days, along with Soundgarden, who released their... Um, Ultra Mega OK full length. I believe this is SST as well. Yeah, so this is a, a pinnacle release for Soundgarden because they followed suit and said, well, if Screaming Trees are on SST and there's a long history at SST of other kind of underground, um, really well-respected artists. So Soundgarden follows suit and goes to SST and releases, releases Ultra Mega OK in November of 88. What about the other half of Green River, though? You had Mud Honey get formed, and of course, the other half, Jeff and Stone, formed Mother Love Bone with Andrew Wood. So this is Shine. Shine comes out March 20th of 1989, a much different direction than Mud Honey. Mud Honey stayed punk, they stayed garage, they stayed lo fi. Um, Jeff and Stone had a different direction. They pulled Andrew Wood in. He was previously in Malfunction, and they were going for a much bigger, I guess you could say, more commercial sound. They immediately started getting the attention of major record labels, and that's the direction they went. Mother Love Bone obviously ends tragically, but June 1st of 89, Bleach. This is an important one. Now, Bleach, if you go back on the roots of Nirvana, very much rooted in the Melvins, right? Chris Novoselic was actually a roadie for the Melvins early on. Um, Cobain was uh, good friends with Buzz from the Melvins and had a lot of interactivity there. So Bleach is important. It was recorded famously, I think it says it right on the back here, by Jack and Dino for 600 bucks. Jack and Dino, um, a very well-known engineer in Seattle, but at the time it was tiny. He came from Skin Yard and started his own studio and then just started recording any band that would essentially uh, want to record some songs. So Bleach is cut um, and Nirvana enters the scene. Again, they were from Aberdeen, which is outside of Seattle, but just like Screaming Trees and just like Melvin's, Seattle was kind of the hub, you know, even though Melvin's, they, they actually went down to the Bay Area not long after, but, uh, but Bleach is important, comes out, and they start to follow suit uh, with Mud Honey because it's a sub pop release. So uh, Nirvana immediately starts going overseas and touring. Soundgarden, Mud Honey, and, uh, and Nirvana were the first, uh, as well as Tad, I think. All of those bands uh, started 
hitting Europe pretty heavy because the press in Europe was starting to pick up and Sub Pop did a great job of getting the European press. Uh, there's a famous article that came out in Melody Maker that act actually kind of cemented the scene and made the US uh, press actually take notice. So Bleach is important of 89. The next one on the list, September of 89, Soundgarden. This is huge because they take the leap from SST, which was an independent, uh, you know, kind of mom and pop label, essentially, even though it was kind of a, a grown up uh, indie label. Soundgarden's the first one to go sign with a major. They release Louder Than Love on A&M Records, which is huge because, um, you know, the bands at this time, they had no idea. In fact, um, Steve Turner from Mud Honey will say, like, he thought these bands were joking and kidding themselves that it could be a career. Like that was part of, uh, his, his, uh, butting of heads with Jeff Amon and Mark and, uh, Stone Gossard early on is that Stone and Jeff wanted to make a career out of music and the mud honey guys were essentially like, that's not even possible. It's a pipe dream where nobody we're playing this music. No one cares about it. Soundgarden's the first one to prove that wrong because they go on and they sign a major record deal with A&M, which was a huge, huge step, uh, for not only the band, but for the scene in general. And following suit, you have the debut from Alice in Chains, August 28th, 1990. So this brings us into the 90s. Alice in Chains was interesting because they made the leap immediately, went straight to Columbia for a major label release. And at the time, labels had no idea what to do with this band. They were uh, very much touring with all of the hair metal bands of the day, Warrant and Skid Row and all those types of bands. For them and Soundgarden both, the labels didn't know where to put them. There was no format for them as far as radio was concerned. Um, MTV was maybe playing them only on late at night, Headbangers Ball, 120 Minutes, things like that. Um, but Man in the Box was a big breakout single. Um, I don't know if it really crystallized into uh, becoming the first big song for grunge, obviously, because I don't think it really has been established yet, but certainly a big release and puts Alice in Chains on the map for sure. Um, they were even, you know, if you go back to the pre-facelift stuff, even kind of into the hair metal stuff themselves a little bit, trying to find their place uh, with facelift, certainly they did. And as they, as they go on and progress into their career, really fine tune, um, you know, where their place in the genre was with facelift was an excellent, debut. November of 90, Apple from Mother Love Bone comes out. Um, Andy Wood has passed away at this point. Terrible tragedy for the scene. Chris Cornell says in, in the PJ20 film that Andy's death was kind of the death of the scene, not necessarily Kurt Cobain's. Now, for someone like myself, from the outsider's point of view, I don't even know any of this is happening yet. So, uh, but if you're if you've been in the scene like Cornell had from, since '85, '86, and a lot of these bands, they've already been at this for five years. And when Andy passes, um, it throws a huge wrench into the scene in regards to their apprehension about how big this will or could become. Apple's a great release, um, a fantastic album that I, I don't think the importance of it can really be um, overstated about what it means, not only for the legacy of uh, the Seattle scene, but obviously what uh, is to follow it with the birth of Pearl Jam, Jeff and Stone coming out of uh, Mother Love Bone. Directly out of that, you get Cornell's tribute to Andy Wood. So he writes the song, Say Hello to Heaven, and he writes a song, Reach Down, as direct tributes to, for his friend Andy. He takes them to Stone and Jeff uh, to potentially record a couple tracks as tribute songs, and it ends up being a full-fledged album. They bring in the rest of Pearl, Matt Cameron uh, on drums, which is incredible, who obviously uh, starts in Soundgarden and is still in Pearl Jam to this day, um, and Mike McCready as well. Eddie Vedder comes in on Hunger Strike. One of those albums, uh, talk about a moment in time. It's just like, you know, the circumstance was terrible. Um, and by and large, when this album comes out in April of 91, it's relatively unnoticed, especially again, on a mainstream level for someone like myself or other, other people around my age, because we haven't heard of a lot of this scene yet. You know, it, it's, it's, it's underground. It's not in the mainstream. So this album gets my attention later on. And I think most people 
discover this album well after it comes out once Nevermind and 10 and all these other albums come out because you can go back and you're clamoring for anything and Temple of the Dog is just so fantastic. So beyond Seattle, beyond the Pacific Northwest, there are other scenes developing. Smashing Pumpkins is in Chicago and they come out with Gish and honestly they get really good traction with Gish. Uh, this comes out in May of 91 and I do remember seeing some snippets of Smashing Pumpkins on like MTV, uh, the video for Siva I believe. Really early stuff produced by Butch Vig, who would go on to then, you know, produce Nevermind and then uh, in turn come back for Siamese Dream. But Gish is definitely an important release in this story because it shows that it wasn't only Seattle. There were, there were scenes developing in cities all around the country because there had been such a strong underground. And even more so because the mainstream was so candy coated and so glossy and Everyone was just burnt on Michael Jackson and Madonna and Paula Abdul and everything that was um, dominating the mainstream tr music uh, and media at that point. So a band like Smashing Pumpkins is important to this story for sure, be just to show that it's not only happening in Seattle. August 27th, 91, 10 comes out from Pearl Jam. Again, um, somewhat underground. Epic Records, uh, not a lot of expectations. Um, Nirvana, Nevermind, doesn't come out until a couple months later. And Nirvana, I'm sorry, Pearl Jam had been touring, uh, doing clubs. They toured with Alice in Chains a little bit. They originally were touring as Mookie Blaylock, changed their name to Pearl Jam to release the album with Epic, and were just working hard to build any amount of momentum. Um, and and as a live band getting their chops together, which if you go look at the early, early shows of Pearl Jam um, in late 1991, you'll see some fantastic sets in small little clubs. So uh, 10 comes out to relatively minimal fanfare. And then Nevermind hits. September 24th of 91. Um, this is when it all changed. Like for me as a kid who knew nothing of anything prior. Everything I have just talked to you about, I knew nothing about. I had heard Pearl Jam a little bit or maybe maybe Gish a little bit, but when this album hits and I realize like, oh man, this is, this is what's going on. This is something I can grasp onto as my own. Like that's, that's the pinnacle moment for me when I realize that, oh, this is like the tip of the iceberg. It's the taster, right? You can go and then you can find all of these other albums that we've talked about here and go back and understand how Nevermind became to be. Now, could any of these other albums, past or even present, have been the album like Nevermind? Maybe. Was Smells Like Teen Spirit that much of a better song? I don't know. It all comes down to time and place and luck, right? Like that's a big part of it. You can watch plenty of interviews with, with Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic, them discussing the timing of this and and uh, and how uh, it was really just the stars aligning. Nirvana was actually in Europe that whole fall of 91 on tour and had relatively little idea what was going on in the States. Like, of course, they're getting reports back. They're hearing the album goes to number one, but they're playing like small little dingy clubs and halls in Europe. Um, then they come home and they realize they're these massive rock stars now and are, uh, you know, all, uh, getting all the demands to do interviews and all the press and everything that goes along with it, which, again, dream come true. That's what they were shooting for. But at the same time, you can't ever think or expect that it would have broke the way it did. And it was a, it was a game changer. October, just a couple weeks later, Bad Motor Finger is released, the follow-up to Louder Than Love. Um, Certainly, Super Unknown coming later in the story would be, I think, the peak of Soundgarden's uh, mainstream popularity. But for me, after getting exposed to Nirvana, kind of already hearing about Pearl Jam a little bit in regards to 10, and then seeing Bad Motorfinger and, you know, the Rusty Cage video outshined, like, man, you want to talk about an eye opener. These couple months at the tail end of 91 going into early 92 were just off the charts um, again in, in for me personally realizing the groundswell that was happening and uh, Bad Motor Finger I always really really appreciate because of that and the timing of it um, it culminates a little bit um, with the single soundtrack which you know was being filmed in Seattle in like 91 early 91 I believe 
um, by Cameron Crowe, who had great foresight into capturing the scene of Seattle and, uh, and weaving it into a traditional kind of rom-com film, right? But, uh, but Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, uh, Chris Cornell, Cornell's first solo work, Screaming Trees, Mother Love Bone, even pulled in Jimi Hendrix and Hart, like just a fantastic snapshot of what was going on at the time. Um, and I love hearing these stories about how you know, the bands were involved in this, especially the Pearl Jam guys who were working in the film and had cameos in the film. Like, they actually needed the money because they were just working musicians at that time, even though they had had a record deal. They didn't have a record out. They weren't touring and making any money. So they, they actually needed this film to, like, you know, survive at that time as just working musicians in Seattle. So I, uh, I just, I love the fact that this is, uh, it captures that moment and the live scenes in the film of Soundgarden and Alice in Chains playing are just fantastic. Absolutely love it. And my opinion, it's, it's got to be, if not the best rock soundtrack of the 90s, it is one of the best without a doubt. Screaming Trees then. Follow suit with a major label release, uh, Sweet Oblivion. This is a fantastic record. It features Nearly Lost You, which was on the single soundtrack. Definitely one of those bands that um, I think never really got the recognition they deserved at on a mainstream level, but an incredible discography. This is one of the high points, and certainly within this story was a high point for them in that early 90s scene. Uh, Sweet Oblivion comes out September of 92, uh, predating two albums that come out later that same month, which are really, really big. That is Dirt, the follow-up to Facelift. This was huge. I remember when this came out, and um, I remember thinking this is the heaviest, most in-your-face, most aggressive, grungiest album I can even imagine. At that time, I had no no foresight into what was going on with the drug abuse uh, because I was a kid. But I remember feeling the heaviness of it, and I think that stays to this day. It's one of the heavier, uh, the heavier albums, just thematically, out of this entire bunch, right? So, Dirt uh, propels the band, certainly moves them out of the facelift era where they were kind of attached to that hair metal scene, and moves them fully into the Seattle kind of grunge epicenter, and was all over MTV and just amazing imagery amazing vocal harmonies which was great to hear you did you weren't hearing vocal harmonies uh with you know Soundgarden or uh Pearl Jam and Nirvana so it was great to hear some of that come in with Jerry and Lane Dirt is uh just a masterpiece of an album that same day Core by Stone Temple Pilots drops this album was interesting at the time because the first thing you heard from this album and from the band this being their debut was Plush and Plush got a pretty bad rap because of the resemblance in vocal style that uh, Scott Whalen had with Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam. And so you started to get rumblings of like, oh, now you're getting kind of the copycat bands. These, this, this band wasn't even from Seattle, they're from San Diego, and it sounds just like Pearl Jam. But for me, that really stretched as far as Plush. Because if you go listen to Cracker Man, you go listen to Dead and Bloated, you go listen to Wicked Garden, you go listen to Sex Type Thing, none of that sounds like Pearl Jam to me. It all sounds like heavy guitar alternative rock, which is this entire crate, if you want to describe it as that. But, uh, but for me, it was a pretty lame comparison, and I think it was overblown, similar to how if you think back to that time, or if I think back to that time, you would hear a lot about the Pearl Jam Nirvana dispute, and then you would hear about... Uh, Stone Temple Pilots not fitting into the scene. It's like all that stuff was media driven, to be honest with you. Like if you just focus on the music and you go listen to this and, and you put it in the chronological order like I have, it's a fantastic record. Another band, this one actually from Seattle, which also gets a bad rap. Early, uh, summer of 93, July of 93, Candlebox comes out with this self title record. And this, again, was a really big album on radio. A lot of big hits. Um, Change, Far Behind. Uh, I think were the two cover me, I believe was a single as well. Couple, couple of big singles on this. Um, and it was definitely uh, categorized as a little bit of a copycat as well. I think got a bad rap. I don't think it 
holds up as well as a lot of these other albums from this era, but still an active band to this day, still a hardworking band that has its roots set in Seattle. And so I wanted to include um, some offshoot albums like STP, like Candlebox. And then if you move on to uh, just a week later, July 26th of 93, you get the Smashing Pumpkins follow-up. So Butch Vig uh, produces Gish. He then gets tapped by Nirvana to do Nevermind. And he comes right back to Billy Corgan and produces an absolute masterpiece. Siamese Dream, I don't think, uh, can be underestimated uh, in this entire, entire crate. I think it stands up there with all these albums. Um, is it grunge? I don't know. I guess so. It's a, it's a, it's a label, but it's certainly guitar-driven um, alternative rock with amazing drumming, amazing instrumentation, um, masterful recording for sure. So again, it's just a part of this story that you have to tell, even though uh, that obviously the pumpkins were coming from a different area of the country. September of 93, September 21st, two albums drop. You get the long, highly anticipated follow-up to Nevermind, and you get In Utero, which at the time was um, not very well received. You started to hear stories about the Nirvana camp and uh, some disruption there, certainly from Kurt Cobain's side. Um, a lot has transpired since Nevermind comes out. I mean, they're the biggest band in the world. Um, and it almost harkens back to Bleach, you know? Bleach was a kind of punk-laden, uh, garage rock, scrappy album. And then you get Nevermind, which is a lot more polished. You bring in Dave Grohl on drums, tons of energy and power. You get a conciseness to Nevermind. And then they go back to Steve Albini, or they go to Steve Albini to produce In Utero, and it's literally just a band in the room, um, which is fantastic to hear. And I greatly appreciate that approach, and I greatly appreciate what Nirvana was going for with In Utero, and I think it succeeded um, so well. Uh, songs like Serve the Servants, uh, Heart Shaped Box with a big single, very eight, Penny Royalty, all, ap all Apologies. Just a fantastic record um, through and through. Um, it was frustrating at the time to, uh, to experience from an outsider's point of view what the band was going through because you just knew it was really, really hard. And, and the reports you were hearing about Kurt and his health and his drug abuse and all those things was very frustrating. But I remember the fall of 93 listening to this album i remember thanksgiving break having this album in my cd man just listening to it on repeat just being amazed that they pulled this off after nevermind because you know when something hits as big as nevermind and it is literally world changing on a music scale how do you follow that up well you go back back to the room and you know just you're a rock band you hit record and that's what they did so i love that the other album that came out on that same day, which is uh, certainly uh, ironic, is the Melvins' uh, major label debut. The Melvins had been around at this point, you know, they were 85, 86, early, early days. And you just know that labels are, are, are signing anyone and everyone when they're, they're bringing the, the Melvins into the major label fold, right? Uh, this album actually holds up really well. It is this, I would say, along with Dirt, kind of the grungiest and also... Uh, Super Fuzz by Mud Honey, kind of the grungiest, um, you know, heavy, heavy, heavy um, representation of that Pacific Northwest sound. I think Houdini is a great representation of that. And I and I, I wish I would have known more of bands like Melvin's and, and Mud Honey, kind of the more underground bands back at that time. But again, pre-internet days, it's it's hard to do that, you know, unless you're in that local scene or unless you're old enough to go to be seeing the the, the bands in club settings, right? Uh, but uh, definitely holds up well. Appreciate uh, appreciate Houdini. Next on the list, talk about um, highly anticipated follow-ups. Versus drops on October 19th, 1993. They are undoubtedly one of the biggest bands in the world, along with Nirvana. This was, I think, a pretty, um, pretty aggressive follow-up. Tin had, similar to Nevermind, um, a gloss to it. Um, but when you come out of the gate with Go and Animal and you've got songs like Blood and Rear View Mirror and Leash, this was a pretty angsty record from Pearl Jam. 
arguably one of their best albums. Um, and at the time, the band had just completely retreated. They, uh, they had stopped doing interviews. They had ceased doing any videos for this album, any music videos. It had all just gotten out of hand. Um, and this is, uh, you know, again, it was originally called Five Against One, and now it's called Versus. It's like, this is them basically attempting to understand what was happening and what had happened just in the last like 18 months of their lives, right? It culminates in a perfect moment uh, that encapsulates that, uh, that talk track. On October 25th, 1993, Eddie Vedder gets stuck on the cover of Time Magazine. Reportedly, Cobain and Vedder uh, had both agreed to not participate in this story and then Time stuck Vedder on it anyways. Um, it's a pretty, pretty funny read. You can go back in here um, and they call out bands like uh, Urge Overkill and Porno for Pyros. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting, albeit high level view of what was actually happening at the time. The Breeders are in here, certainly the Pumpkins or Nirvana. Um, but if you can imagine walking into, you know, a doctor's office or a dentist's office and seeing this laying on the uh, table in the reception, that's just uh, um, unthinkable. Like, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. And if you can imagine uh, what Eddie Vedder felt seeing this, <laughs> just uh, a really weird world that he was living in. January 25th of 94, Jar of Flies. Um, I remember this one being completely off my radar. I remember walking into the store and seeing this and being like, oh my God, Allison Chains has something new out. And then you heard it and you realized, oh, this is stripped down. This is like acoustic bass, which was uh, crazy considering it was the follow-up to Dirt, one of the heaviest albums in this entire bunch, right? But it went on, Jar of Flies went on to be one of the best-selling uh, EPs of all time, at least at that time. Um, and it harkened back to their earlier release, Sap, which was a, an EP they put out in their earlier days, I believe after Facelift. And, uh, but, but I didn't know about it at the time, but going back now, it's fantastic. So this is the split jar of flies sap that contains both of them. And I appreciate, uh, I love that Allison chains would totally step outside their comfort zone, strap on acoustic guitars and just really let the harmony shine. And that's what jar of flies does for me. March 8th of 1994, Super Unknown drops and Soundgarden, I think finally gets catapulted onto that level with Nirvana and with Pearl Jam. Um, certainly Bad Motor Finger had some huge songs on it and they were touring the world at this point. Um, but when you've got songs like Black Hole Sun and Fell on Black Days and Spoon Man, um, it just pushed them to a whole different level. This is one of those, that for me, this is kind of my physical graffiti of the era. It is an absolute, um, just draw dropper from start to finish. The songs um, like Suicide and Fourth of July, um, just so many great tracks that I think are uh, completely unique to Soundgarden and to this album. The Day I Tried to Live, Limo Wreck, Mailman, just some really unique stuff. This one, along with, I would say, uh, Siamese Dream would be at the very top of my list as far as uh, perfect albums coming out of the 90s. And then a month later, April 5th, 94, Kurt dies. Um, and that's, you know, not the end of this. It, but it certainly, certainly puts a dark cloud over all of it. Because if you think about when this started in, let's say, late 90 early 91 leading up to Nevermind coming out in September of 91 and it blows up. So you've got about three solid years now of mainstream coverage of the grunge era. You've got mainstream press. Uh, it had taken over MTV. It had taken over the magazine racks. It had taken over um, popular culture in regards to clothing and fashion, all this stuff. And then Kurt passes away and it kind of feels like, oh, is that the end of it? Well, it wasn't the end of it, but it certainly painted a dark, dark period, um, a dark, dark picture for the rest of the period. Immediately following up Kurt's death, a week later, Live Through This comes out. The titles Live Through This, I mean, had, had, the timing wise is just so awful, but this is a great album. It really is a pinnacle release. It's not Hole's first record. 
um, Pretty on the Inside, I think was the name of the first record that it came out a couple years prior. And they had obviously been working on this one. Kurt passes away a week before it's due to drop. Courtney, you know, she's stuck in hell having to deal with um, the controversy around his death, whether or not to put this album out, whether or not to tour behind this album, all these types of things. So you've got a huge storyline. Um, and then the Unplugged record comes out. Um, from Nirvana. This comes out in November of 94. Now it had aired way before that, but it finally comes out as a release at that point. But I remember the day Kurt died and they just had unplugged on repeat the entire day. Um, a beautiful unplugged, I would say up there with Alice in Chains as, as some of the best. I love Pearl Jam's unplugged as well, but, uh, but this one's important because it's kind of the bookend um, to Nirvana as a band, even though they would go on to have many releases after this in regards to um you know unreleased material and things like that but uh but the unplugged has a, a somber feel to it uh and that's quite an understatement continuing the somber vibe into december of 94 vitology comes out and this is kind of the sound of pearl jam trying to a figure out who they are as a band b work their way through a transition of it being kind of Stone and Jeff's band into becoming Eddie's band that started on Versus, but it's even more prevalent here from a songwriting perspective. Um, and the band had, again, con continued to retreat from the mainstream, continued to retreat from any press videos. Uh, they were starting to inch towards their era of uh, touring without Ticketmaster, and the whole thing had just gotten out of control and had become... Um, a distraction, I think, you know, I think that in a lot of ways, that's what it, it, it had gotten to be, because of the press coverage and because of the scrutiny on the individuals, Eddie specifically. So, uh, but Vitology, when this drops and Spin the Black Circle comes out, I mean, I'm a, a vinyl nerd and I'm like, it was absolutely incredible for me. I was still all in and still am on, on, on a lot of, and from a lot of perspectives, you know. Also came out that day. 16 Stone by Bush. Seems like an odd one in here because obviously the band's not even from the States and, and not necessarily in the scene. But the influence that all of these bands have was reaching so far that you've got a band like Bush that gets signed. And this was a huge album, uh, huge singles. Everything's in, uh, Come Down, uh, Machine Head, Glycerine. This was a big, big breakthrough album, a debut album. Um, and it's just a sign of, again, uh, the, the amount of influence and the amount of, uh, or the efforts of the labels to just find any band that had that same sound and push it. And, and, and hey, I ate it up. I was right there buying it. I was ready for the next great kind of grunge alternative band. And Bush was one of those uh, that came out of nowhere. Another sign that things were kind of changing and bands were continuing, you know, labels were uh, starting to look for new different things, whether it was from uh, areas of the country or the world or even genres. The President of the United States. This is an album that came out of Seattle. Actually, Kim Thale from Soundgarden plays on this album. Uh, this drops in March of 95 and is a, a great example of maybe, maybe people are sick of hearing this. You know, maybe people are sick of the uh the kind of grunge sound and what's going to be next and this is the labels kind of reaching for something that's next a completely uh you know garage rock punk influenced fun record i think great songs um but it's one of those as the as the years go by and as you get into uh 95 and certainly into 96 things start to change um that same month, Above from Mad Season uh, drops. This is uh, Lane Staley from Alice in Chains, Mike McCree from Pearl Jam, Barrett Martin from Screaming Trees on Drums, and John Baker Saunders. Um, the soul release and one of those uh, pinnacle albums, I think, with Temple of the Dog, uh, as far as one-offs are concerned, kind of super groups that really stands the test of time. Fantastic album. It's bluesy. It's experimental. The songs are great. It's stripped down um, and um, just an incredible, an incredible example of musicians coming together for a cause. This album 
was essentially Mike McCready reaching out to Lane Staley saying, hey, let's let's go work on something to try and help Lane get out of his drug abuse. Unfortunately, that drug abuse would continue for years to come and it wouldn't work, but, uh, but Mike gave it a shot and above is what came out of it. About a year and a half after Kurt's death, Dave Grohl drops the Foo Fighters' first record, which he not only wrote all of it, but he also played every instrument on it. And uh, I remember hearing uh, interviews with Dave when they were touring on this record. They were touring with uh, Mike Watt, and then Eddie Vedder was playing in that band as well. And he was getting grilled about all the questions about Nirvana and you know Foo Fighters being a similar style or whatever. And he's like, what am I, what am I going to do? I, you know, before Nirvana, he played in loud rock bands with loud guitars and smashing drums. And, and that's what he does. And after Nirvana, he's the same thing, you know? Um, so a uh, testament to Dave Grohl and his worth, worth work ethic and just getting after it, you know, 18 months after, um, got a new record out and starting his new life with, uh, with Foo Fighters. As we move into the tail end of 95, you get Alice in Chains, last record with Lane. They did not tour very much on this record at all, just a handful of shows. Um, very underrated album in their catalog. And then on in May of 96, kind of the bookend, kind of the swan song, you get down the upside, the band uh, broke up at the tail end of this tour. Um, and then you get Alice in Chains Unplugged, which was not their last performance, but is kind of regarded as one of the last performance because of uh, because of the demise of Lane in those last years. You just rarely, rarely saw him. So I, I think these two albums are a good way to to finish off the story as you go from kind of 86 to 96, those 10 years. Um, just a massive amount of music, a massive amount of influence. And uh, uh, for someone like myself, who at least got into it about halfway through just a life-changing a life-changing occurrence the vast majority of uh of my uh information and uh and history on this is not only in the in the albums themselves but a bunch of books so if you want to read up on this stuff grunge is dead by greg prado this is a great great all-encompassing view as well as everybody loves our town by mark yarm not to be confused with Mark Arm, but these are great books to check out. Grunge is Dead and Everybody Loves Our Town. Those are fantastic. And then if you wanted to get into books specific to different bands, Serve the Servant, uh, Remembering Kurt Cobain by their manager, Danny Goldberg. Fantastic kind of behind the scenes look of what the Nirvana camp was going through. Um, this is an unauthorized biography on Alice in Chains that's really good called uh, The Untold Story by David DeSola. I recommend that. Uh, Steve Turner from Mud Honey put this book out called Mud Ride. Fantastic view of the scene from within Mud Honey, which is a really, really unique view from a band who has lasted along with Pearl Jam all the way through all of this and is still um, active and currently touring to this day. And I would say last but not least is the Pearl Jam 20 book. In addition to the film, the Cameron Crowe directed film, the Pearl Jam 20 book is fantastic. It starts at the very beginning uh, with Andrew Wood and the Mother Love Bone um, tragedy and goes all the way up through their 20th anniversary. So just a fantastic read. So check those out, check the albums out. I'm going to continue to, uh, geek out on, on this era of music that has impacted, uh, I know not only my life, but so many other people's lives. So super fun going through this type of, uh, journey. And now I get to put all these records back on my shelf after I listen to them all. So thanks for listening. As always, my name is GI Sanders, and this has been another episode of Talking.